Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Shannon Brazil. I'm 21 years old and terrified that I will not escape my blue collar life in Boston, Massachusetts. I fancy myself an artist, but in my neck of the woods, artist is another word for weirdo or loser. So my parents have fallen on hard times and I'm also a college dropout. Really, I'm a receptionist and I'm so unhappy. And my mom knows that I'm unhappy. So she calls me at this horrible job one day and she says, Shan, there's a misprint in the paper today. $49 Boston to LAX based on round trip purchase. You really ought to get it. It's false advertising if they don't honor it. <laughs> she says, use my credit card. It'll be an adventure. So a few weeks later, I'm touching down at LAX, my first plane ride alone, my first time on the West Coast. My cousin drives down from San Francisco to pick me up, and we are young and hot, and we are ready to roll. And so we go and take that city for two days like nobody's business. And a random connection leads us to the world-famous Polo Lounge in the Beverly Hills Hotel. We're hooked up, so we don't have to pay for lunch there. And Jennifer, my cousin, is talking, and I just don't know what she's saying because just over her shoulder is this man, elegant, older. He's in a suit, but it's not the men's warehouse kind of suits that I'm used to. <laughs> this is different kind of fabric I've never seen. And I think he must be important because every time they bring him a plate, uh, with like the tiniest little morsel on it, they bring him a new glass of wine too. And this is such a mystery to me why somebody would need so many glasses of wine. But in my memory on the table that I'm sitting at, there are like, in, this is how I really remember it. 10 forks, 10 knives, 10 spoons, 10 plates. Like, uh, you know, there's, it's chamber music. It's waiters in, in tuxedos. It's just beyond my wildest dreams. And so... I'm staring at this guy, and, and he's staring at me, and at first I think maybe he's looking at somebody behind me, but he raises one of the 10 glasses at some point and uh, gestures toward me. And it's heat. I, I just have never felt like this before, and I've never certainly had the attention of this kind of a man. And I see him at some point look across the room at the waiter and do this which in the 90s is the international signal for check, please. <laughs> and I know this is my big chance, so I don't know what my cousin is saying still or what we're talking about, but I excuse myself and I, and I go to the bathroom. And my plan is that I'll, I'll be leaving the bathroom right when he is uh, exiting the restaurant, and I'll be able to at least walk by this handsome older man. While I'm in the bathroom, I realize that we've been at the beach. I've been in the ocean in the clothes that I'm wearing. <laughs> I'm wearing a white tank top, uh, a peasant skirt long before it's called peasant. Um, it's been soaked and it's dried. My hair is windblown and salty and I'm just a mess. And I spend all this time trying to make myself better. Uh, I, I find the super special sparkly lip gloss and I think that should probably do it. But it's probably taken too long and the guy's gone. So I open the door, and there he is. He's waiting smack outside of the bathroom door. And I can't do the accent, but if you can suspend your disbelief and, uh, and just like take your, do your own accent in your head, it went something like this. Bonjour, mademoiselle. I am so charmed to see you. Oh, it is my honor. I must say hello. My name is Jean-Pierre. <laughs> so I'm absolutely dying. Uh, he tells me that he would be honored if I would meet him same time, same place tomorrow for lunch. It would be his great privilege. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. So my cousin is leaving anyways, back to San Francisco that night. And uh, I spend the next 24 hours trying on every single outfit, making my hair perfect, trying to just get back to the hotel to this crazy older man. And finally I arrive. So Jean-Pierre is 51 years old. He's older than my dad. 
And he is um, a finance person in the movies. He travels all over the world. His wife died five years ago. Uh, he has kids. They're all grown. And he orders food for me that I've never heard of. He orders a bottle of Dom Perignon, which is some kind of special fancy champagne that I've never heard of. We drink the whole bottle. It's delightful. I feel like, you know, a princess. And he says, where are you staying? May I send a car for you? I would love to take you to dinner. Now, I don't want to tell this guy that I'm staying at a place that rents by the hour on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> but I do tell him that um, it's at capacity, so I don't know where I'm staying that night. And, uh, you know, I can't be reached. I don't have a cell phone. or a... He says, my darling, please allow me to get you a room here at this hotel. Please. It would be my honor. No strings. No, I'll be a perfect gentleman. I promise. I promise. And... Uh, so I, I know, I mean, I can feel like the staff is kind of hearing what's happening here. And I know this is an older, wealthy guy. I know I, I'm, I'm more than um, half his age. And, uh, and I decide, you know, I'm here on a fluke because of a $49 ticket. And I don't know if I'll ever bump into a guy like this again. I certainly won't be in this hotel again. It's 400 and something dollars a night. And this is the 90s. And I said, fuck that. I don't give a shit what it looks like. Yeah, I'll stay here. Sure, you can do it. Yes, I'll take the room. And I sprint back past the prostitutes, and I pack my duffel bag, and I go running back to that hotel. And he takes me that night to the most exclusive French restaurant in his red vintage convertible Mustang, uh, which I've only seen on TV. And the whole dinner, he's telling me, you're so beautiful. Oh, my goodness, my darling. You're so, you're so this, that. Now, that sounds a little bit strange to me. A, because all around me, is like, it's like Demi Moore, Monica, uh, wait, Monica, it was her TV name. Uh, it's Courtney Cox. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Maria Shriver is sitting next to me. It's a tiny, tiny little place. So... For this guy to keep saying, you're beautiful, you're beautiful, it's, it's crazy. But not only that, I was the ugly duckling. I was not the pretty girl growing up. I was uh, not called by name. I was called Doug. And it was so bad that when I was in third grade, I was encircled by a, a, a gang of hoodlum, crazy, blue-collar boys who took turns spitting. So it's not, it wasn't just the average adolescent thing. So to be hearing this and to be in this place, no matter if it was superficial or whatever it was, it was just really kind of an out-of-body experience. So... Later that night, we're in the piano bar, and he says to me, my darling, you have the face of an angel, but the eyes of a witch. I'm telling the truth. It's true. And I said, Jean-Pierre, you don't have to say these things to me. Based on your accent alone, I'm going to sleep with you. And he says, but I am delighted to hear this. Let us go right now. <laughs> and he leads me off to my hotel room. And he undresses me. And we are making out. And now up to this point, I've been with less than a handful of boys. But I assure you, none of them can love me the way that this man is loving me. Right? In fact, I think that it's this very experience that taught me to hold out for epic. <laughs> and we make love, and he is crazy. You know, he's just so experienced. I don't know what I'm doing. So he's patient. He's worshipful, of course. And, um, and it goes just all night. And I expect in the morning I'll just never see this guy again. And that's fine. I have an experience. And, and I'll write it in my journal. Uh, <laughs> But what happens is we spend the next two days at the Beverly Hills Hotel together. And he uh, works at the cabana while I do cannonballs in the pool. And then we make love and we order food. And then it's uh, more cannonballs and more work. And it just goes on like that for two days. And after uh, the two days are over, he has to go back to business. You know, his, he's going back to France. And he says, 
I shall love to, I shall love to see you again. Have you seen the Italian Alps? They're so much better than the Swiss side. I, I must take you there. And I said, okay, yeah, sure. No, I've never, I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> and he says, I want you to stay as long as you like. The staff has been told that you're to sign for everything. You want a white fluffy bathrobe? Sign. Massage, pedicure. I don't even know what a pedicure is at this point in my life, but I'm told to sign for it and I should have one. And so he leaves and I spend the whole rest of the week at the Beverly Hills Hotel. <laughs> And I become really close with the staff, my people. <laughs> uh, and I write every detail in my journal. I don't want to forget a single, a single thing about this crazy trip. And I go back to Boston, back to my, my world, and my horrible job. And a couple weeks later, I get this message on my answering machine from Jean-Pierre. My darling, I, it's been so long I've been thinking about you. I hope you've been thinking about me. I can't wait to see you again. Okay, you're not there, but I'll call you. I can buy you a ticket. We should meet in Italy. It's going to be so good. I can't wait to show you these things. And this voice fills up my, my room. And this voice is attached to like palm trees and Beverly Hills and stuff that was so far beyond my imagination. But... It's filling up the room in my parents' house on my own little private telephone line in, in their home, which actually in a couple of months they'll lose in a foreclosure. And I can't quite um, understand how the two can exist side by side, this incredible life of, of privilege and a life that was about to fall apart on me. And so um, I just couldn't. I couldn't find that bridge. And although he called and called, I just could never call him back because I felt like I didn't belong in that world and I didn't belong in this world either. And yet I had seen it. I'd seen the, the West Coast. I'd seen LA and the Hollywood sign and I was changed and I couldn't unsee it, which is what I wished I could do. But now I was different. And so it took a whole year and a half of working really hard and being so determined. But in the end, I drove away from Boston in a tiny little Corolla. And I always forget the part that I'd, I wouldn't leave my pets behind. So I actually drove with a new puppy, an Amazon parrot, and a four-foot iguana. <laughs> and with no job and no friends in Los Angeles and those three animals, it was quite hard to find an apartment. But I did, eventually, it was maybe my, my 20th application, and I handed it in, and on, you know, in person, which was the key, I think, because I could beg. And this guy uh, gave me a chance, and I, I got a studio apartment in West Hollywood, I mean, the tiniest little place. And basically what I had was no furniture, but I had one fork, one spoon, one knife, a plate, a cup, and a used mattress on the floor. And for all it was worth, it might as well have been the Beverly Hills Hotel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.